Uh, good evening, Claire. Thanks so much for joining me. I want to ask you specifically hello, about hello. free speech. Uh, you've been such a champion of free speech over the years, and, uh, and now you continue to do so uh, from the House of Lords. Um, but tell us, where are we at with free speech at the moment? Because every now and then I feel that we're making progress, and sometimes I feel we're regressing. Uh, do, you think I, do you think I've caused to be optimistic, generally? So, I want to say that we should be optimistic, because in some ways, many of the issues that you and I would have worried about, where we thought that people didn't notice that there was a clampdown on free speech, for example, around the issues of gender or sex, or indeed things that were happening on campus have almost spilt out onto the streets, and therefore more people have seen them. You know, whether that was during the Black Lives Matters period, the issue of decolonization, which seemed like one of those tiny little things that suddenly become a massive issue because of what's happening in relation to Israel and Gaza and so on. And therefore, you could say more people know about it, more people will be up in arms. However, this is the downside. The downside is, is that these days, if you say to somebody that's censorship, they say, so what? You know, there is no longer a, an assumption that being for free speech is a positive value in society, even in a democracy. So I think that we have to be on our guard. And even, I mean, I, I know you were on a panel that I chaired on the culture wars, and um, whether the culture wars is an irrelevance, so a discussion we had at the Battle of Ideas Festival. So many people say to me, oh, you know, the thing is, the culture war is just superficial, you know, it's bound to fizzle out, it's going to go away, um, it's overblown, we've seen the end of it. Actually, if anything, it's becoming more entrenched, deeper and more sinister. And so, although I'm optimistic about the fact that more people realise there's a crisis of free speech, I'm not as optimistic that we can be complacent unless we have shows like yours, organisations like my own, the Academy of Ideas, and we're constantly on the lookout for ways of explaining to new generations why free speech is so important to them. I think that's one of the concerns I have, is that um, I always like to stick up for the younger generation and say that they're not as censorious and authoritarian as everyone thinks. But then these surveys keep coming out that show that a lot of the younger generation do support censorship, particularly on university campus. Um, do you think that's the problem, really, that, that, that people at universities are being told that uh, censorship is, is a good thing? Well, it's starting much earlier, I'm afraid. I mean, I think that schools have become responsible for, on the one hand, um, pandering often to young people. You know, if, if you know, there's a crisis of adult authorities in many ways. Um, young people can have always been thought that they knew it all, um, but the role of adults was to say, no, you don't, or to at least challenge them and not to affirm every single, you know, bit of ignorance that they've come out with. These days, it's become more fashionable for adults to kind of think, oh, well, what do we know? This is a new generation of radicals who are so insightful and they understand the massive world of online issues and what, how can we say anything? And that's one of the problems, you know, that, that if you look in schools ever earlier than even university, you'll find that teachers are intimidated by pupils who'll say, we should decolonize the curriculum. And instead of saying, what are you talking about? I'm here to pass on the best that's known and thought. And they sort of go, oh, maybe I'm a bit old fashioned and traditional. So I think that crisis is one that my generation and, and younger generations have made. And the very young generations are suffering the consequence of a failure for us to, in some ways, face down their ignorance. And, um, you know, th there are some worrying aspects of this that are not because sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, Claire, you're always going on about free speech, but it's, it sounds so abstract, you know, there's a cost of living crisis, people have got lots, there's wars going on, what about climate change and so on. But I think that we can see in a very visible way in relation to what's happened with Israel and Gaza, that, you know, you there are consequences to these things, right? And this is, you're asking what I think about 2024. One of my major dilemmas at the moment is the absolutely rotting, uh, you know, vicious anti-Semitism that we've seen openly expressed in Western countries, in the UK, all in the name, by the way, of decolonization. And I immediately want to say, sack that person, you know, <laughs> clamp down on that phrase, ban that demonstration, because I'm so concerned myself at what we're seeing, which is explicit racism on the street. 
And yet we've got to hold our nerve. Because actually the reason we know that anti-Semitism exists is precisely because people have been free to talk about it, exhibit their bigotry, so that we can confront them. But it's based, that bigotry, often on a very uh, ill-informed understanding of what's happening in the Middle East, let alone historically the significance of um, what anti-Semitism means. I mean, I saw today, I, 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 you're all looking Christmassy and I've been discussing Christmassy films. I've got a very dull background because I'd put my laptop away for Christmas, but then I decided it was more important to go out. Uh, Christmas uh, bedlam happening downstairs. But people are out Christmas shopping today, and the next minute there's an attempt at shouting and screaming at Zara the clothes shop on the basis that somehow uh, this is associated with somebody who has been pro-Israel. I mean, if you had a sense of historical... Uh, specificity, you would know that trying to close down shops on the basis that it's got some association with Jews isn't a good look. You know, it's Quiet. associated with a very dark period in history. Shouting so, the word genocide at anything and everything that's a nasty war, a vicious war, but calling it a genocide, all of these terms have very specific historic meaning. And I know that you are a great supporter of encouraging people to understand history where these things come from, so that you might at least pause when you kind of casually wander into an anti-Semitic uh, you know, trope. So that, that's something that I think is very interesting. I think a lot of us have been tested uh, in recent uh, weeks uh, in terms of our commitment to liberal values, because as you say, there are people there trying to shut down shops. There are, there are authoritarians. And uh, I've been quite a little bit troubled that a lot of the people on the free speech side have, have, have almost abandoned some of their principles and said, well, the only solution to authoritarianism is another form of authoritarianism. In other words, sack uh, university lecturers who are supportive of, of, uh, of, uh, Pal of, um, of Israel or Palestine or whatever, whichever way you want to go. So how do we uh, re retain our resolve when it comes to, as you say, seeing these awful declarations that none of us really want to see in the public square? Well, I think that I, I've taken some heart from uh, an American organization. So I just want to make sure I get it right, which is FIRE. And it stands for the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Um, and they're a fantastic uh, free speech organization in, in America who have really held their nerve in relation to those um, instances of university leaders who, if you remember, suddenly discovered that they were interested in free speech when asked if the you know, calling for the genocide um, of, of uh, Jews uh, might be a problem, right? And they kind of all started saying, well, we believe in free speech. And of course, we were all screaming, lots of us screaming, absolute hypocrisy, because these people have been the most censorious uh, in terms of American university campuses. The people who have suddenly discovered free speech as a virtue, for example, you know, the union, the, the the university union, which has been trying to close down gender critical feminist academics for some time, but suddenly when it comes to Israel Palestine, say, like, How dare you? and so on and so forth. It, it's very frustrating to see that double standard. But on the other hand, think of the consequence of those of us who know that the importance of an open mind, free expression, being able to argue things out in a rational way, if we become endorsers of giving the authorities the right to close things down on the basis that speech is dangerous. And we have to be very clear on that. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, that the, you know, that the state shouldn't have their eye on people who are explicitly supporting Islamism. And um, I wish that the police would clamp down where there's anti-Semitic harassment and abuse, which is different, by the way, to free speech. But to just simply say that a slogan itself should mean that you're arrested or that any demonstration should be stopped, I am nervous of. Where on that demonstration somebody's climbing all over, you know, public buildings, then, you know, take them away, right? That's fine with me. That, in a way, is, is a public order problem. It's not the same as speech crimes. And I think we've seen, you know, we're looking ahead, but one, one of the things that's going to happen in 2024 could happen would be that Ireland would bring in this absolutely incredibly draconian hate speech legislation, which actually I'm hoping might get kicked down the road. It's in the equivalent of the Irish Lords in their Senate, and they keep putting it off a bit. 
I mean, that gives the authorities incredible power to police your phones, your WhatsApp messages. Your, even if somebody sends you a message which is considered to be hateful, you can be arrested for that. All of these sorts of things are happening in the name of clamping down on hate speech. So even when I hear hate speech, I have to remember that ultimately the best way to deal with so-called hate speech, which is open to interpretation, because I'm accused of hate speech, you're accused of hate speech, uh, you know, we're accused of being transphobic or because we don't go along with critical race theory, you might be accused of being racist. All of these things are accusations levelled at us. We have to remember that giving the state or the authorities the power to label things as hate and then clamp down on them will mean that we're all silenced. And that's a very dangerous situation. Uh, absolutely excellent point, Claire. Thank you ever so much for joining us on the show. Really appreciate it. Happy Christmas. I am having a good time, really. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you too. Get some decorations up. <laughs>